coming on the air with some big cities staring down. The potential for tornadoes tonight with millions of people in the path of destruction that's already ripping up towns. Millions more facing storms that could bring a ton of rain and a lot of hail. We're live in hard hit Oklahoma where they're just starting to clean up. Also new tonight, fury both here and abroad after Israel admitted to killing seven aid workers in a strike on Gaza. The new reaction from the White House tonight on what's quickly becoming the deadliest conflict for humanitarian workers ever. Then, in tonight's original, why experts say we're headed off a child care cliff with centers for kids either shutting their doors or families priced out with nowhere to go. Plus, the Americans who got stuck on island time now racing to catch up to the cruise ship that left without them. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now you've got tornado watches blanketing multiple states with dangerous spring storms charging across the country, millions in their paths, making for a potentially very dangerous night. Look at this. You're looking at one of nine tornadoes we've seen over the last 24 hours. You see that funnel cloud off in the distance? That one and the others leaving behind, obviously, a trail of damage. Look at that. A car flipped up on its side. Trees falling on top of roads. Last night, a town in Oklahoma took a direct hit with homes obliterated. Fortunately, amazingly, nobody was seriously hurt. Nobody died. But what makes these storms so dangerous is when they hit in the middle of the night. Imagine waking up to this. And tornadoes are not the only concern here. You've got storms putting nearly 60 million people from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf Coast at risk, including several big cities. We're talking really intense winds, like 90 miles an hour. Look at that. You see this trash can just blowing away, basically. That's coming on top of heavy rain that makes it very difficult to see. Plus, Hail the size of golf balls coming down from the sky. Look at that there. You see it smacking onto that porch. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is standing by with the forecast, but I want to start with Morgan Chesky, who is on the ground in Barnesdale, Oklahoma. So, Morgan, obviously a town that was hit straight on by a tornado. Tell us what you're seeing and what they're bracing for next. Yeah, highly incredibly frightening because we don't have any video of this tornado because, as you mentioned, it struck under cover of nightfall, uh, causing widespread damage in this section of the town. Uh, exhibit A right behind me. I had a chance to speak to the gentleman who said he was inside this building about 10 minutes before that tornado struck, and he walked out of his home just feet away to witness the damage here. Uh, incredibly lucky, as you mentioned, in that they had enough warning time to take shelter. I want you to hear what one man said about what he did with his own family when that storm was moving in. Take a listen. We got in the cellar last night, so. You and the fam? Yes. You take your family into the cellar, what do you tell them? We're hunkering down, I guess. I mean, if the house is still standing when we come out, it's still standing. Uh, fortunately, their house was still standing. Others not so lucky here. But by and large, Oklahoma was spared. We've seen multiple funnel clouds reported across the state, Hallie. But uh, this community, only one that really took a direct hit. Uh, no reported injuries here. But it wasn't just tornadoes, Hallie. They had to contend with heavy rains and hail in a lot of instances as well. Uh, North Texas reporting hail the size of golf balls, some even approaching tennis ball size. That can be incredibly destructive. Uh, but today, the concern, as you mentioned, shifts to the east, northeast. We know that the governor of Kentucky declaring a state of emergency there uh, after a, a combination of really dangerous conditions have struck that state. High winds, alleged tornadoes ripping through some mobile homes, pushing semis right off the road. Uh, we know that at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, the a downdraft came so quickly that one student knocked right off their feet. So as this storm system, which is responsible for all of this, continues to make its way across, uh, it is going to be incredibly critical for people to pay attention to the conditions in their neck of the woods. That's what made a difference here in this community. They said that they were very focused on which direction uh, these cells that could spawn tornadoes was moving, and that's why they were able to take shelter in time here. Hallie? Morgan Chesky, live for us there, right in the thick of it. Morgan, thank you very much. I want to bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who is watching this for us. So this is such a critical moment here, this particular time, because we know the storms are getting more and more intense, especially as we start to hit the evening hours. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. It, really, within the last 20 minutes, we really saw that activity ramp up. So we're really talking about tennis ball size hail, even up to softball size hail, long tracking tornadoes, violent tornadoes. Look at this right now. This is what's happening at this very moment in terms of watches and warnings. 
warnings. See these red boxes here? Those are tornado warnings. These just popped up in the last 20 minutes. That's telling us that the activity is starting to pick up. We have tornado watches through the evening. That will probably be extended as we go throughout the early parts of the overnight hours. I overlaid radar here just to show you what's happening. We have a lot going on in terms of that heavy rainfall. We're looking at those bright colors, reds, oranges, yellows, showing us where torrential downpours are happening. That's going to cause some flooding. And look at all this lightning along that cold front. You can see where that cold front is. And then on the back side of this, we're looking at really cold air. Now we're going to talk about snow, and we're talking about feet of snow in portions of New England to upstate New York. Right now, we're looking at rain in portions of uh, the northeast. Now, as we go throughout tonight, we're looking at enhanced risk in many spots. We're looking at 53 million people at risk for long tracking tornadoes, damaging hail two inches or greater. That's going to cause damage. We saw pictures where it did cause damage. And winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour. Lexington, you are in the bullseye for some very strong storm. This is where the wording is violent and also long tracking. Columbus also, but we have an enhanced risk too. That's all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So from the Great Lakes into the Gulf Coast, we're talking about Columbus, Charleston, Chattanooga, Birmingham, and also Montgomery. Then as we go throughout tomorrow, this will all move off to the east. We're still talking about the chance for strong storms. Not as strong as today, but still on the table. So 22 to million people at risk for storms from D.C. down to Raleigh, Charleston, Jacksonville, Tampa. Where you see this yellow here, that is a likely spot for seeing those stronger storms. Also, the winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, damaging hail, and a few tornadoes are possible. Now let's talk about the rain because we're looking at heavy downpours over saturated grounds. These are storms going over the same area. So 41 million people impacted by flood watches. Where you see this red here, that red box, that is a flash flood warning. That means that flooding is happening right now or it's imminent. That is super dangerous. You want to heed uh, any warnings you have in your area. So keep that in mind and look at all this rain that we're expecting over the next day or two. New York City or outside of New York City, we're expecting up to three inches. Hallie? Michelle Grossman, lots to watch. Yeah. Uh, I know you'll be with us throughout the night as we keep an eye on all of it. Thank you very much. We're also watching what's happening overseas, including the global anger over an Israeli strike that killed seven aid workers for the humanitarian group World Central Kitchen, run by celebrity chef Jose Andres. You see a car here we're about to show you with the organization's logo, a hole obviously ripped through the top, the inside just devastated, with passports found at the scene. We're just learning more about the victims tonight. Damien Sobel from Poland, according to a local mayor. Saif Issam Abu Ta'a, a Palestinian. And Zami Frankham from Australia. Three are from the UK, one a dual US-Canadian citizen. With the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, calling this tragic. With the White House official slamming the Israeli government, saying it's got to do a better job of communicating. Secretary of State Tony Blinken demanding more protection for aid workers delivering critical food and water and medicine to people, people in Gaza heroes. who need it. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer. All of it devastating, of course, to so many, including the organization's founder, Chef Andres, who we're just learning got an apology call, essentially, from the Israeli president. Andres accusing Israel of using food as a weapon of war. Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv for us tonight. Israel facing mounting questions today about how its forces killed those seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen, the victims from around the world, Australia, the UK, Poland, Gaza, and also at least one U.S. Canadian dual citizen. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying this was a tragic case of Israeli forces unintentionally killing non-combatants. Israel has promised to mount an investigation at the highest levels to find out what happened here. But World Central Kitchen, the charity founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying that the killings are unforgivable. And they are asking how this could have happened, given that the three cars in this convoy, at least two of them, were clearly marked with the logo of the World Central Kitchen. They were driving in what's called a deconflicted zone, a zone that's supposed to be safe for humanitarian organizations to operate in. And the charity is saying that they spoke to the Israeli military ahead of time about the movement of those vehicles. I asked an Israeli government spokesman, given that the organization did everything it possibly could have, apparently, to signal to the Israeli military that it was not a threat. How is it possible 
that these seven aid workers still killed by Israeli bombs. This spokesman saying to me that this was an unintentional strike. It was a mistake that happened in the chaos of war. Now, it may have been a mistake, but it was far from an isolated incident, according to the United Nations, which says more than 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war, the vast majority of them Palestinians. That is a toll that shatters previous records. World Central Kitchen pausing its operations in Gaza in the aftermath of these killings, and we are already seeing the real-world impact of that. There were a number of ships heading from Gaza to Cyprus, carrying aid that was supposed to be heading towards northern Gaza, an area the UN says is on the brink of famine, an area where our crews have seen parents trying to keep their children fed with grass, with barley, meant for feeding animals. Those ships have now turned around with only a portion of the aid delivered. They are heading back to Cyprus, and the impact of that is going to be felt by a lot of very desperate people in Gaza today. Back to you. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that reporting. Back here at home, a critical check-in, if you will, between President Biden and his Chinese counterpart, President Xi Jinping, about the many issues creating tensions between these two, between the world's biggest superpowers. They apparently covered a lot of ground, from Chinese election interference to China's involvement in Russia's war in Ukraine, the debate over Taiwan, China's involvement there, the potential of Chinese cyber attacks targeting U.S. infrastructure, but among all the differences, an area of agreement, right? Cracking down on the trafficking of drugs like fentanyl. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist is following this one for us here. Um, so, Aaron, talk us through it, because this was their first discussion since their 2023 summit, right? These two key leaders at a pretty key moment on the international stage. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They met uh, in the San Francisco area back in November of last year, and this is their first time, the first time we're seeing this meeting at the leader level uh, between these two heads of state. And this was, as you said, a, a sort of a check-in, right? We do want to note, too, Hallie, um, we did just learn that Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, will be going to China tomorrow. She plans to be there for several days holding meetings, including a meeting with the finance minister while she's in China and several other uh, American entities to talk about workers and some American products in China as well. But as you said, this is kind of a progress of meetings that the president has held with President Xi over the course of uh, the last several years. You see on your screen uh, sort of a listing of when they've spoken on the phone, when they've met in, met in person, uh, most recently, obviously, back in November. And again, now we've got this call today between the two leaders that they both have characterized as constructive uh, and very matter-of-fact. Uh, it was interesting to me, though, as I looked at some of the readouts, Hallie, from uh, these this call, that as much as they talked about there being uh, some level settings, some stability between the two countries, there was also... Uh, there were some negative factors in these calls. The Chinese, uh, in their readout from the state media, uh, indicated that the issue of Taiwan is one that has become insurmountable, an insurmountable red line, they characterized it, uh, in talking about how the U.S. seems to be supporting Taiwan, although not supporting Taiwan's independence, still uh, showing some support for, for Taiwan. And then the, the U.S. readout of the call suggested that uh, there were some issues about China's support of the Russian uh, defense industrial base. And so these were places where there's still disagreement. Uh, not so much, though, that they are not going to continue, Hallie, to have these interactions at the secretary level, the cabinet level. And we'll wait to see again when the two leaders might speak. Eric Gilchrist, live for us outside the White House. Thank you so much. Or to get to, too, as it relates to the general election campaign, if you will, because in just the next hour, former President Trump will hit the stage in Green Bay, his second stop in the upper Midwest. He's trying to punch through the so-called blue wall for President Biden in a state Mr. Trump lost last time around by just over 20,000 votes. He's playing a little bit of catch up here. He's hardly campaigned since he became the presumptive Republican nominee back in early March. Compare that to President Biden. You can see where he's been since Super Tuesday, all over the map with these stops. And you have President Biden often going after Donald Trump and his fellow Republicans on an issue that Democrats think are going to be super important come November. And that is the issue of abortion access, reproductive rights. Donald Trump hinting that he will address that more substantively quite soon, maybe sometime soon. Listen to this. President, do you support the six-week abortion ban that the Florida Supreme Court just upheld? <laughs> Thank you.
question. We're going to make a statement next week. We'll make a statement next week on abortion. And yes, that was our own Gabe Gutierrez getting a question to former President Trump there. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is also traveling with Mr. Trump in Wisconsin. So it's interesting here, this issue of abortion, if Donald Trump wanted to address it and share some of his thoughts on this new uh, sort of where, where the abortion discussion stands right now, given what we saw in Florida, he has had opportunities to do that. What is the expectation for what happens next week? What's next week? Right. He's had a year and a half to do it ever since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, Allie. And to note, of course, multiple times over the course of the last year and a half, he has taken credit and celebrated the U.S. Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade. But this timeline that he is now laying out in response to Gabe's question there, he's going to make an announcement next week, could be telling. At the same time, you covered the Donald Trump White House. Oftentimes, Donald Trump, instead of actually answering a question, would suggest that he'd soon announce it. A health care policy was one example of that. And so for Donald Trump, he has not even been clear on whether he would support a federal abortion ban of any kind. He has suggested that it should be left up to the states. But when asked about specifics of, of like, you know, the number of weeks in those states, he has not been specific. He did in Florida say that the six week ban went too far. Of course, he is a Florida resident himself right now. And the Florida residents, including himself, are going to be able to go and vote for abortion rights now in November. So there's a lot of question marks out of exactly what position he could, if he will take a position, one that is, of course, uh, for Republicans at large, a very uh, a difficult uh, answer politically when the majority of the American electorate sides with reproductive rights for women, Allie. So what is the sense now, Vaughn, as he is on the campaign trail, as we've seen President Biden on the campaign trail, do you think, based on the folks that you're talking to in and around the Trump orbit, he will get out there uh, and put sort of foot to pavement, what do they call it, the, hit the stump, to use another political cliche, a bit more? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think that there is reason to believe that he will do that. He's got his trial, which begins on April 15th. That could last anywhere from four to six weeks. Today is notably his first trip to the state of Wisconsin as a 2024 presidential candidate. He got into the race in November of 2022. There were no trials leading up to this point. He still hasn't been to the state of Arizona, another battleground state, as part of his 2024 presidential run. And so for him and his team, there's also an acknowledgement that they're short on campaign cash. Uh, per the last financial campaign finance reports, Joe Biden's campaign had double the money that they did. It takes a lot of money to put it on an event like this. And so for them, you know, Donald Trump flying them around, there are a lot of priorities that they're going to have. And so there's a big question mark between the amount of money it takes on to put at these events, but also the time thing, especially when he's got trials coming up here. Uh, this is a big question mark with just seven months out, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Vaughn, thank you very much. To Maryland now, where you're about to see the governor, Wes Moore, meeting with some small business owners at a place for people affected by the collapse of the key bridge we've been covering as we're getting some brand new pictures from the Navy that shows this wreck underwater. I want to pull it up here. Look at that. So these are the yellow blobs, basically, showing the twisted metal lying at the bottom of the Patapsco River. As you've got the first ships just now passing through a detour channel, essentially, one of two now open. Here's the thing. It is only for critical ships, essential tri ships, like the ones that are helping with cleanup. We're not talking about big cargo ships like the Dolly, the one that crashed into the pillar of the Key Bridge. It's going to take months now to clear this area enough for those kinds of big movers to get on through. Tom Costello is joining us now. And Tom, I want to pull up more of these sonar pictures here. Explain what they mean for the cleanup, what kind of insight that's giving crews. Yeah, let's go back to those. These are really telling. These are 3D sonar images from the U.S. Navy salvage operation. And so that yellow that you see, that's the steel. That's the bridge that is sitting on the bottom of the river right there. It, this is as good as it gets. Uh, they cannot take video and photos under the water because it is so cloudy, so dirty, so murky and muddy that literally if they turn on a light, it's like shining a light into a snowstorm or a fog bank. You, you can't see anything. And divers are already only able to see a foot or two ahead of them. Literally, that's it. So this is as good as it's, get, it's going to get for now to map this wreckage on the bottom of the river. And they need to know precisely where everything is because divers have got to go in and they've got to identify where they're going to cut up pieces of the bridge and then pull it out with the crane. But as you and I have discussed, the trouble is 
That salvage is incredibly dangerous. It is razor sharp. It can cut an oxygen line. It could cut a diver's su uh, suit. So they've got to be very careful. And at the moment, the best they can do is somebody talking to them on the intercom saying, looking at a 3D scan, saying, move to your left, move to your right. All right, above the water, as you see, they're already starting to cut into the bridge that's above water. They're cutting it into chunks and taking it away. This is a very long process. I, I think what's becoming crystal clear, as evidenced by the Coast Guard comments and the, and the Army Corps of Engineer comments today, this is not going to be a quick and easy process yeah. at all, Hallie. And they've been making that clear, Tom, really for days since this happened. There's also some new court documents that we're getting from the owner and manager of the Dolly. Again, that ship that hit the pillar, that's what caused the collapse. It apparently lost power. That says this, that this casualty was not due to any fault, neglect, or want of care on the part of petitioners, the vessel, or any persons or entities for whose acts petitioners may be responsible. Help us understand this in plain English, Tom. What does this mean? And it, is it a question here of liability given what little we know from the NTSB investigation which is still in its very early moments. Yeah, nobody has yet determined what the cause of the accident was. So th this essentially is the company trying to get out ahead of it and say mm. it wasn't our fault. Okay, then how did this happen? I think they're going to be continuing to look at the question of whether contaminated fuel in some way may have disabled that ship. We don't know the answer to that yet. They want to cap their responsibility at 46 million dollars. But as you know, the estimates are this could go to $1.5 billion to replace the bridge. So that really is a, is a shot across the bow early on in the legal fight here. And they're citing a pre-Civil War uh, law, which essentially allows them to limit their liability to the value of the vessel's uh, remains after a casualty. The value of the vessel's remains. That's it. That's what they want to cap their, hmm. their limitations to. So I I'm not sure how well this is going to do in federal district court, clearly it's going to it's going to push the limits of the law. Tom Costello, we're glad to have you continuing uh, to stay on this important story. Appreciate your reporting. Thank you. you bet. Still ahead, a lot more to get to, including some real drama about to go down for Disney. How the fight at the very top of the company might trickle all the way down to you. Plus, John Stewart calling out his former employer, who he says Apple discouraged him from interviewing on his now former show. We're getting into that beat in a sec. A new honor for Taylor Swift. It is big with a capital B. That's in the five things in just a second. But first, another big, a moment for Disney right now that could be potentially huge. You've got this activist investor trying to get his own people on the board in a move that could threaten the company's leadership, including CEO Bob Iger. This is a big beef. It's all going to come to a head in the next 24 hours with this investor, a guy named Nelson Peltz criticizing Disney and specifically Iger for losing money as they tried to navigate the streaming market. So what does it mean if he actually gets his guys on the board, this activist? Here's Alex Sherman with more joining us now. Okay, so Alex, is it an exaggeration or is it an overstatement to say that this is no less existential than the future of Disney at stake here? Honestly, how I would not say that's an exaggeration because the main issue here is succession, which is sort of definitionally the future of Disney. I mean, I think that's the main argument that Tryon has used now, Tryon being the activist investment yep. firm uh, of Nelson Peltz. They've really used that argument for, oh, I'd say the past two plus months uh, in its pitch to investors about why Nelson Peltz and former Disney CEO, uh, Disney CFO, Jay Rasulo should join the board. But really, it comes down to Dis Disney botching succession for the past, let's say, I don't know, five years plus. Uh, maybe 10 years, you could even argue, uh, just a number of times now that Bob Iger has renewed his contract to stay on as CEO of this company. Previous heir parents have gone out the door. He finally did hand it over to Bob Chapek a couple years ago, and uh, that backfired, and now Bob Iger is back. So the thinking is, put Nelson Peltz on the board, put Jay Rasulo on the board, and we can move forward with a better succession plan from this point on. We'll talk about what that looks like because we just put up on screen here all the things that this activist investor says went wrong with Disney, all the fails, if you will. So what is the plan if, in fact, Nelson Peltz has his way and gets his people on the board here? What, what changes? What does it look like? In terms of ideas, we really don't know. And that is a weakness of the pitch of Nelson Peltz, I think. Hmm. Um, he's come up with a bunch of things that are wrong with Disney, but it's a little bit more unclear about what he wants to do differently there. You know, there's another activist, actually, called Blackwells, 
that has nominated its own slate of directors. They have a more uh, tangible idea about what to do with Disney moving forward, which uh, involves around separating out the real estate for Disney and making it in its own uh, REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, which would trade separately. So that would be a fairly uh, different solution to Disney moving forward. From Triad's point of view, their argument has pretty much been, look, we have a good track record uh, of making stocks go up. And also, you guys didn't do a good job with succession. And mm. Nelson Peltz claims he's sort of a professional headhunter. And that's why we should put them on the board. It's not really like they want to drive Disney in any dramatically different direction. In fact, they've come out publicly several times and said they don't want to replace Bob Iger as CEO. They want to let him do his job. They just want a little bit more adult supervision in the board. So bottom line, though, if you like to watch Disney movies or go to Disney parks, are you going to notice any potential change if Nelson Peltz is successful? Or is this mostly kind of juicy fodder for the CNBC crowd? All due respect so it, to our friends at CNBC. I don't think you'll CNBC. notice any particular change uh, immediately or even in the coming months. The change that you might notice is that it is possible that Bob Iger could kind of not get his way with choosing the next CEO of Disney. And that harkens back to the beginning of our conversation about what is the existential threat here? Well, it may be that Nelson Peltz is able to wield enough power on the board to push the board in a different direction in terms of coming up with the next CEO mm. of Disney. Even that, though, is to be determined because he is only one person. And even if Jay Rasulo got a board seat, there are only two people on the board. And the board is, you know, there, there's maybe 10 others or so that could still be in favor of Bob Iger. Alex Sherman, uh, it's fascinating. When will we know more? What's the timeline on this? The annual meeting is tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm told that the vote will happen in the beginning portion of what's usually a two-hour meeting. Hmm. So we may know the results as early as, let's say, you know, 2 o'clock p.m. tomorrow. Sh by showtime tomorrow, we'll have you back. Alex Sherman, we'll see. We'll be watching it. I know you will be as well. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Number one, a 12-year-old boy accused of shooting and killing a classmate and seriously hurting two others at a school in Finland now with police saying that boy admitted to the shooting during an interview. The weapon he used is registered to one of his well relatives. Police aren't quite sure of the motive at this point for the attack, but tomorrow in Finland has been declared a national day of mourning. Number two, a teenager here in the U.S. is, is among those killed by an avalanche near a Swiss resort. We told you about this on the show yesterday. 15 years old, name has not been released. Two other people were also killed. We don't know if they were all related. A fourth person is being treated at a local hospital. Number three, Tesla shares down today after the company missed expectations for its first quarter, with car deliveries down more than 8% from the same time last year. Tesla hasn't had a dip like that since 2020 during the pandemic. The company says it was partially caused by what's happening in the Red Sea. Number four, John Stewart overnight claiming Apple discouraged him from interviewing the head of the FTC while he was working on his old Apple TV show. The comedian says they flat out told him, please don't talk to her. St Stewart talked about it directly to Lena Khan herself in a conversation Monday on The Daily Show, of course, the head of the FTC. Khan had written a report calling for the breakup of big tech companies like Apple. Apple reps so far have not responded to a request for comment. Number five. In a year of big news for Taylor Swift, more of it, she is officially a billionaire, one of 14 celebrities on the updated Forbes World's Billionaires list. She's now the first musician to get that title strictly off of her music and performances, not from other sources of income. It's just from the albums. Forbes estimates Swift's net worth to be $1.1 billion. Coming up, cruise ship passengers stranded for days. We'll tell you how this dream vacation turned into a nightmare and who may be to blame. Plus. Some dramatic moments, a hiker saved after clinging to the side of a cliff. Look at that, how rescuers spotted him just ahead. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what the TELUS is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, remember those migrants who ended up in Martha's Vineyard after Ron DeSantis put them on a chartered flight from Texas? A judge now says those migrants can sue the charter flight company, saying that the company and Florida officials were not, in the judge's words, legitimately enforcing any immigration laws. As for DeSantis himself, the governor of Florida, he's off the hook. The ruling says it doesn't have jurisdiction over him. Out of our Western Bureau, take a look at this really scary footage out of California. Do you see that little dot, that guy clinging to the side of that cliff? 
a climber dangling over the Pacific Ocean. He apparently fell. Rescuers found him using some pretty complex thermal imaging. They were able to get him hooked up and lifted out safely via helicopter. Just incredible. And out of our Northeast Bureau, another traffic nightmare on I-95 cutting through Philly. Officials say that stretch will be closed for a couple more days after a truck crashed into an overhead bridge. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but this is right near the same part of the highway that was closed for about two weeks last summer. But a fiery crash led to the collapse of an overpass. Also tonight, a dream vacation turning into a nightmare for passengers who were trying to maybe rejoin a cruise ship that left them stranded on an island. Now, some of them are doing this, like, amazing race-style trek, flying through seven countries in 48 hours, trying to catch the ship at a different stop. It all started last week when the passengers, six Americans, including a pregnant woman and two Australians, were late getting back from a private tour. So they got left on an island near the equator, this small, small country nation. Country, I should say. Now, the cruise ship company, Norwegian, says, listen, while this is an unfortunate situation, guests are responsible for making sure they get back to the ship at the time they're supposed to. They say they've been working with local officials to get those guests back on the ship at the next stop. I want to bring in Josh Letterman for more on this. So, I mean, it really does sound like something out of The Amazing Race. Where are they, these people? Why, like, where are they trying to catch this boat? Why aren't they going home at this point? What's up? So if you've been on a cruise before, Hal, you know that essentially when you get to port, you have two options. You can go on an organized tour that is run by the cruise company where they kind of take responsibility for getting you back on time, or you can do your own thing. These eight passengers did their own thing. They booked a private tour. There was some issue. They didn't get brought back to the ship on time. And when they got back to the ship, it was still there, but it was already in the process of leaving. Kind of like if you show up for a flight after the doors have closed, but the plane is still technically on the ground. And so the cruise company says, look, it is well known to all the passengers what time that we're leaving. We announced it on the intercom. We put it on a poster next to the exit of the cruise ship as you're getting off the ship. You got to get back to the ship on time or the ship is going to leave without you. But these passengers say they really feel like Norwegian dropped the ball here. And I want you to hear from a, one of them, Jill Campbell, who told the Today Show about her experience. Take a look. I believe that they really forgot that they are people working in the hospitality industry and um, that really the safety is and the well-being of their customers should be their first priority. And and that should be placed first. Um, we, we believe there was a basic duty of care that they had forgotten about. Earlier today, the ship arrived in Senegal, and just as we were coming on the air, Hallie, Norwegian followed up with us to say that all eight of those passengers have now reboarded the ship successfully. There's also this other piece of it, right? Another woman who was left on the island, but for different reason. This was a, this was a medical situation. That's right. She's 80 years old, yeah. Julie Lenkoff. She apparently uh, started coming down with uh, some memory and vision problems. The ship's medical personnel evaluated her and said, look, you need to go to a hospital. Mm. So she went to the clinic on the island. Uh, and at that point, her family says the ship left her there to die. And she eventually had to make her way back to the U.S., where they believe she uh, now believe she had had a stroke. Uh, but the cruise line says, look, once she got off and went to that clinic, we tried to follow up with her. We called her multiple times. She was released from that clinic uh, in good condition. And given privacy laws, we couldn't call anyone else and disclose her medical condition. They say they did everything possible to try to get more updates about her and to help her once she was in port. But ultimately, it is true that ship left without that, that patient who had, yeah. who had been entered that clinic. Josh Letterman watching all of it unfold. Josh, thank you. Coming up, fighting for the right to see the total solar eclipse. The legal battle just launched by inmates in one state's prison. We'll tell you why. Plus, the push to remove a council member from office in one state, how his ties to white nationalism are leaving a community divided. All right, so polls are about to close pretty soon. In this local election that's making headlines nationally, and if you're like, well, wait a second, Hallie, why do I care about an Oklahoma City Council meeting? Let me tell you why. This goes back to 2017, when a guy named Judd Blevins, you're about to see him here on screen, marched alongside white supremacists in that big Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Remember that? He says he was just there to help preserve statues of American soldiers because, in his words, it's our heritage. Well, last year, this guy gets elected as a city council member in this Oklahoma town, something that the more progressive voters in one of the country's most quickly diversifying towns, they were not happy about that. 
That sparked this push to get him out of office. There's this recall election today for that. And the person who's been on this story from the jump is our Brandy Zadrozny, who is joining us now from Enid, Oklahoma. So, Brandy, what's so interesting here, right, the demographics of this city that have changed a lot in the last few years, it's still conservative, but it's a recall election that's gotten a lot of attention in some of the sort of corners of the Internet and, you know, space that you cover. Yeah, this has been a real talker across the internet and and more mainstream news spaces, and it's it's a it's a wild story, and it's mostly a wild story because um, we often see you know far right extremism slinking into local government is a story that we've seen quite a lot actually, especially after um, January 6th and even before that during the rise of the alt-right. What we don't see as much is this coalition of, yes, progressive Democrats that came and joined this group called the Enid Social Justice Committee, but also people like the mayor, who is a conservative Republican, people like Cheryl Patterson, who's running against Jed Blevins, Jed Blevins um, conservative Republican. It really is this coalition of people who might have a lot of differences generally, but can say this isn't happening here. Now, we've been talking to people outside of this polling place all day, and they've had uh, a lot of interesting things to say. Take a listen. It's an embarrassment to the community to have anybody who had Nazi affiliations on the city council. Just because the fact that he has uh, white nationalists and or Nazi ties and just the fact that that's, that's not, well, obviously I'm morally opposed to that, plus that's just not a good image for Enid. People do care that it does matter what you've done, who you've associated with, and who you're still associating with if you're saying you don't have to answer questions. So we're getting all this kind of response here, people saying they didn't know and people saying that they wanted a redo, and that's just what they're getting today. Can you explain that piece of it, right? Because um, was this known before his election last year? That's complicated. Was this on the internet? Yes. But again, Enid is a pretty conservative place. Um, people who did notice it are people who are the more progressive people. Now, this doesn't mean that they're young and on the internet all the time. My two favorite sources from the story, um, Connie and Nancy, are in their 70s, um, progressive Democratic mm -hmm. ladies, and they found this stuff on the internet and they uh, they told other voters about it. And these are the groups that, um, that went around and got signatures and that had this recall petition filed. So it's really because of them that we're here at all today. Uh, we love seeing, you know, you out in the field doing this reporting, Brandy, because you do so much of it in this space. What is the, when will we know if this guy's been recalled or not? Like tonight, do we think? Tomorrow morning? Yeah, we will see how much power this coalition actually has tonight around 8.30 Oklahoma okay. time. We'll be watching uh, Brandy Sadrosny. Good to see you there. And Enid, thank you so much for bringing us that story. To New York now, where we're learning tonight that some inmates in state prisons there are suing the corrections department. Why? For their decision to put prisons on lockdown during next week's solar eclipse. Now, typically, these are prisoners who are allowed outside between 2 and 5 p.m. If you have a pulse, you probably know that that is when this eclipse is set to happen, just six days from now. That day, however, these inmates will be forced to stay in wherever their housing units are. Now, this lawsuit from inmates says, I'm quoting here, that a solar eclipse, you see it here, is a rare natural phenomenon with great religious significance to many, and that if they can't see it, if they can't watch it happen, then they're going to be denied, in their words, constitutional rights to practice their religion. Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now to break it all down. There's a million eclipse stories out there. This one is really interesting here. What is the what is the rationale from the prisons? Is this security, why they're forcing prisoners to be inside during the eclipse? Well, we got our hands on the memo that went out to the prisons, and they called this a, quote, proactive approach to ensure the safety and integrity of the facilities, pointing to the darkness associated okay. with the eclipse. But they didn't give any more detail beyond that. I was on the phone with the spokesperson. He refused to go into detail, pointing to the statement, let's pull it up, saying the department does not comment on pending litigation. Religious requests related to viewing the eclipse are currently under review, hinting perhaps there that they might have some sort of settlement uh, to resolve this situation, noting that yes, prisoners between 2 and 5 p.m. will be asked to stay indoors. Mm. At the same time, they are providing glasses to anyone who might happen to be able to view the eclipse out the window. Who might be out, okay, who might be yeah. near a window, be yeah, able to see it. Exactly. You talked about the potential religious exemption here. What, um, 
Help us understand that religious argument when it relates to a, a total eclipse, which is super rare. Yeah, well, as part of this lawsuit, there were testimonies, uh, written uh, memos made by the prisoners. There are six plaintiffs in total in this lawsuit. Let's just go through some of them. The Christian plaintiff writing that portions of the Bible that allude to what many have attributed to a solar eclipse during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Muslim plaintiff in this lawsuit writing one of the holiest books of Islam, the Hadith, which describes what many believe to be an eclipse happening as Muhammad's son died. And then the atheist plaintiff writing, observing the solar eclipse with people of different faiths is crucial to practicing his own faith. So this is very much seen as a religious experience for these plaintiffs. I was just on the phone with the attorney representing them to, to asking him if there's going to be any sort of resolution to this. They're running out of time. It's Monday. Well, like, well, they gotta, they, you know. That is exactly his point. He said that there is a phone call scheduled tomorrow with all parties involved. Hopefully they can reach a settlement. We'll have to wait and see. And he reiterated that all they're asking for is that the plaintiffs as well as anyone else who's put in for a religious exemption to this memo be able to go out and see the eclipse in person. You can see the path of totality there with the question, should these New York prisoners be allowed to watch the eclipse? Maybe find out this week. Or we'll tomorrow. See. Or tomorrow. Or soon. Thank you so much, Erin. It's great to see you. Appreciate it. Got a lot more ahead, including the cost crunch of childcare. If you're a parent, I know you know this. I know you feel it. How daycares are trying to find a balance between being a business and being an essential provider. Next. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's daycare centers facing a really big challenge here. They lost billions of dollars in money from the pandemic era, which has forced some places to close down. Others have had to raise what they charge. They've had to basically raise tuition. Caught in the middle, of course, a lot of families who are already struggling to make ends meet. Here's Raheem Ellis. Daycare is a place where kids can dream to be anything. A doctor a post office worker, a dragon. But centers like this, Victoria's Castle Daycare in New York, are in a tough spot. $24 billion in pandemic federal funding for child care, used for things like tuition assistance and teacher pay, ran out back in September. Now that the crisis is over, it just seemed like everybody forgot that we were here. Director Erica Perez says the center lost a quarter of its funding and had to raise tuition by about $200 a month. It's the center's first tuition hike in years. It puts a strain on some families. Carell Bain is a single mother and a post office worker, and for her, money is tight. Next month, her four-year-old will move from three days a week in daycare to five days, bumping her monthly tuition to more than $1,200. A thousand plus is almost damn near my whole check, and hopefully it can be brought down a little sum. The daycare tries to work with lower income families' budgets, but that can be tough because the center also needs to make money. That is always the concern. You know, how, how flexible can I be and for how long before the whole, you know, deck of cards comes crumbling down? Sometimes she's forced to make an agonizing decision either keep a family that can't pay or let the child go. You're almost, you know, saying goodbye to one of your family members. You become very attached to your families in, in your care. The loss of funding also means teachers here are getting hundreds less in bonuses. I wouldn't leave because we're going through a tough time. That's when you stick it out the yeah, most. Yeah, it's more than just money here. Over a few months, the center's enrollment more than doubled after other daycares in the area shut down. It's a familiar story nationwide. The Century Foundation, a think tank, estimates in each state, tens, even hundreds of thousands of kids could lose care. And a new survey of early childhood providers found more than half knew of a program closing in their community in the past few months. When we don't have reliable childcare options, that means that, you know, many women are going to either lower their work hours or leave the workforce altogether. President Biden just signing a spending bill that'll give an extra billion dollars to childcare programs. And some say the private sector has a role too. 
media company, The Skim, launched a campaign calling on businesses to publicly share their child care policies. The responsibility to help working families, working parents and women stay in the workforce, stay as participants in this economy, doesn't just fall on one person or one part of the society. All of these businesses like Verizon, Paramount and MasterCard did share their plans, including things like work flexibility and care subsidies or stipends. It's a big problem begging a bigger solution to help ease the burden on parents looking to give their kids a brighter future. Rahema is joining us now. It is such a crunch for so many families. What are some of the other options for people who've got to have this child care but, but just don't have the resources to be able to pay for it? In some instances, Hallie, it's slim or none. Some yeah. families find that they have to try and ask for friends help to, or family to help. If they're in a community where they don't have a lot of friends or family, maybe it means they have to relocate. It was mentioned in the piece, sometimes families have to cut yep. back on their hours. And what does that mean? That means they're going to be looking to the state, the city, and the government for some kind of welfare. So it's a whole community impact that's going on here. And it means not just the centers are struggling, but these families are struggling, too, for where will they provide care for their children while they go to work? Rahima Ellis, uh, so many families, you know, thinking about this, dealing with this. We're glad to have you reporting on it for us tonight. It's good to see you. Thank you. That does it for us for this hour. And a reminder, starting on Sunday night, that'll be my first night as anchor of the Sunday Nightly News on your local NBC station starting at 630. I'm excited to see you then. But for now, here on NBC News Now, more coverage picks up right now. Coming on the air with breaking news, possible tornadoes on the ground as we speak in Kentucky and Tennessee. Millions of people in the path of destruction. Look at this, already ripping up towns. Millions more facing storms that could bring a ton of rain and dangerous hail. We've got the forecast and we've got a live look at where these reports of tornadoes are right now. Also new tonight, anger both at home and abroad after Israel acknowledged killing seven aid workers in a strike on Gaza. The new reaction in tonight from the White House on what is quickly becoming the deadliest conflict for humanitarian workers ever. Then former President Trump in the heart of the so-called blue wall, as in just the last hour, we're learning he's suing some of the co-founder of his social media company, why he says they shouldn't get any stock. Plus, the new pictures of the Key Bridge collapse, not from the air, not from the ground, but from underwater. We're going to explain some of what you're seeing right here and what they tell us about how long the cleanup will take. And the CEO of Disney fighting to keep control of the company tonight in a beef that has major stakes. We'll talk about what this may mean for Disney park goers, Disney movie watchers a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and right now as we speak, reported tornadoes are charging across Kentucky and Tennessee as dangerous spring storms sweep the country. You've got tornado watches blanketing multiple states, millions of people in its path, making for a potentially dangerous night. Look at this. This is one of the nine tornadoes, not one of the reported ones most recently, but in the last 24 hours, this funnel cloud that is going through the state of Oklahoma here, leaving behind a trail of damage toppling over semi-trucks. Look at this, trees. Look at that truck flipped there. You've got trees falling onto roads. You had one town in Oklahoma overnight taking a direct hit with houses just obliterated here. Fortunately, incredibly, nobody was badly hurt. Nobody died. But what makes these storms so dangerous is when they happen in the middle of the night, right? Because that's when the sirens go off. Imagine waking up to this. <laughs> We've got live coverage tonight of all of it. Morgan Chesky is standing by live on the ground in Oklahoma. But I want to start with meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who is watching these tornado warnings. OK, so we've got the map up. Where are these tornadoes being reported right now? So we have confirmed reported tornadoes on the ground. They're confirmed. So what is that? So they are. That, that yep. means they're actually confirmed happening. in Indiana. We okay. saw cars flipped over. That was confirmed by law enforcement. Kentucky, West Virginia was radar indicated. It looks like we dropped out on that one. And also Tennessee, this one is confirmed. So right now, this is a live image where we're looking at this one in Kentucky a powerful, dangerous storm. So if okay. you're in this warned area, moving off to the northeast, same story here, you need to seek shelter. You need to heed this warning. You need to get to the lowest level of your house, your basement, if you don't have a basement, the lowest level, yeah. interior part of your house, ba uh, bathtub, even a door jam, if you can do that. What's the population? I mean, this is outside of the centers of Nashville and Cincinnati here, but do we think that these are communities where a lot of people live? Do we Lexington. know? Lexington. 
Yes, oh, Lexington. or Louis, Louisville. Yeah, so it's okay. moving through yep. Louisville. This is populated. So this is a dangerous, dangerous situation. We're watching that one very closely. Southern Indiana, this is what moved down into Kentucky, and that's why we're looking at portions of Louisville seeing these strong storms. Let's lay over radar here because we're going to okay. see that we have a lot of a lot of rain with this, yeah. a lot of lightning. Look at this right here. Where you start to see the purple, that's where we're seeing hail, too. So it's not just the tornadoes. It's not just the heavy rain. We're looking at hail as large as two inches, three inches. What does that mean? Well, tennis ball size hail, softball size hail, that caused damage to yes. cars. And we're seeing winds gusting up to 75 miles per hour. So in Indiana, we saw semis flip, just like what you showed in Kentucky. Same sort of story. When you have a uh, wind that fast, you're seeing those cars flip. This is the cold front right here. So easy to make out. It's moving into this really warm air mass. And that's why we're seeing all this weather here. Look at even down to the southern end, right? We have these tornado watch boxes. This is through this evening. So this is not just right now. We're going to be talking about this over the next several hours, at least until 8, 9, 10 o'clock. It gets dark. That's yes. when things become really, really dangerous. On the back side of the system, we're looking at snow falling. So that's another piece of the puzzle. We have the heavy rain, we have the tornadoes, then we're going to see blizzard conditions as we move this to the east. Tonight, so many millions American, 53 million under this severe weather alert. When you see all these colors here, you don't normally see this moderate risk. So we're talking about Lexington, we're talking about Columbus, and then we're also looking down to the Gulf Coast states. So Columbus, Charleston, Nashville, Chattanooga, Birmingham, Montgomery, Atlanta, Tupelo, all these major cities under the threat of these storms. And we're talking long tracking tornadoes. Yeah. When the National Weather Service starts to use verbiage like that, that's when it starts to be really concerning. Okay. Violent storms, and that's what we're seeing. We're going to see that hail. We're going to see the winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour. That's going to bring down lines. That's going to bring power outages, especially in the darkness of night when we see these storms moving. And then as we go towards tomorrow, we're not out of the woods yet. We had it yesterday, today, and then tomorrow, 22 million people at risk. We're not expecting the strong storms like we're seeing today, uh, but we're still uh, expecting the chance for a few tornadoes. So it's not zero and also some really gusty winds. Michelle, thank you so much. A lot yeah. to watch. Will you stand by? Let us know if you hear anything else, yep. see anything else as mm -hmm. far as these tornadoes. Morgan Chesky yeah. knows the kind of damage this can cause. He is live for us in Oklahoma, which overnight was at the epicenter of these storms. Obviously, that's shifted to, as we've just been talking about here, the area near Louisville, the area near Cincinnati, Tennessee, etc. Tell us what you're seeing, Morgan, uh, and walk us through that. Yeah, Hallie, it's wild to think that the same storm system causing so much, pro so many problems uh, over to the northeast had the same issues here in Oklahoma overnight. And it's incredible that there were no serious injuries considering the damage that you see. I, I spoke to the gentleman uh, who lives in this home. He told me he was in his garage just a few minutes before the storm struck. And he says, like so many other people here in Barnstool, that it was the early warnings that they received from nearby meteorologists that gave them those precious few minutes they needed to take shelter uh, ahead of this reported tornado, uh, one of several across the state of Oklahoma. Uh, and as it stands right now, Hallie, the folks here are somewhat in the clear, uh, but that is still dealing with some of the shock from last night. I want you to hear uh, one man's encounter when that storm moved in. Take a listen. We got in the cellar last night, so. You and the fam? Yes. You take your family into the cellar, what do you tell them? We're hunkering down, I guess. I mean, if the house is still standing when we come out, it's still standing. Fortunately, that gentleman's house was still standing. And that wasn't the case, though, for everyone. We do know that the, the cleanup effort is really going a long way here uh, in this community. We've seen uh, dozens of volunteers show up to help people move forward. Unfortunately, this storm still has that tornadic threat. Uh, the state of Kentucky, uh, the governor there issuing a state of emergency uh, after we've seen drenching rains, those powerful winds wreak havoc there. Even if it's not a tornado, Hallie, it can still pose significant problems to, you know, light structures uh, and to any individual who's caught out in the middle of it. And I think the sheer size of this system uh, is just really shocking a lot of people. The fact that it's ripped through so many states and it could, dro it could drop even more rain. But as it goes to the north, uh, we're talking about blizzard warnings, all from a system that here in Oklahoma was spawning tornadoes. So the good news to report tonight, no reports of anyone seriously injured or injured whatsoever here in Oklahoma. Uh, but we do know that there is still a long way to go for this particular system. Allie. Yeah, for sure. To your point, Morgan, so many people dealing with the aftermath where you are and so many people further north, further east, bracing for what is to come. Morgan Chesky, thank you very much for being there and for your reporting. Take you overseas now to the global anger over an Israeli strike that killed seven aid workers for the humanitarian group World Central Kitchen.
a group led by celebrity chef Jose Andres. You see a car here. You see the logo on top? It says World Central Kitchen with a hole clearly blown right through the roof. The inside just decimated. You're about to see that. And then, of course, passports found at the scene. We're just learning about some of the victims. Damien Sobel from Poland, according to a local mayor. Saif Isam Abuta'a, a Palestinian, and Zami Frankham from Australia. Three are from the UK. One is a dual US Canadian citizen. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling this tragic. But a White House official is slamming the Israeli government, saying it has to do a better job of communicating with Secretary of State Tony Blinken, demanding more protection for aid workers delivering critical food and water to people in Gaza who need it. These people are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer. All of it so devastating to so many, including Chef Andres, who we're just learning got an apology call, apparently, from the Israeli president. Andres accusing Israel of using food as a weapon of war. You see it there. Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv with more. Israel facing mounting questions today about how its forces killed those seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen, the victims from around the world, Australia, the UK, Poland, Gaza, and also at least one U.S. Canadian dual citizen. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying this was a tragic case of Israeli forces unintentionally killing non-combatants. Israel has promised to mount an investigation at the highest levels to find out what happened here. But World Central Kitchen, the charity founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying that the killings are unforgivable. And they are asking how this could have happened, given that the three cars in this convoy, at least two of them, were clearly marked with the logo of the World Central Kitchen. They were driving in what's called a deconflicted zone, a zone that's supposed to be safe for humanitarian organizations to operate in. And the charity is saying that they spoke to the Israeli military ahead of time about the movement of those vehicles. I asked an Israeli government spokesman, given that the organization did everything it possibly could have, apparently, to signal to the Israeli military that it was not a threat. How is it possible that these seven aid workers still killed by Israeli bombs? This spokesman saying to me that this was an unintentional strike. It was a mistake that happened in the chaos of war. Now, it may have been a mistake, but it was far from an isolated incident, according to the United Nations, which says more than 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war, the vast majority of them Palestinians. That is a toll that shatters previous records. World Central Kitchen, pausing its operations in Gaza in the aftermath of these killings. And we are already seeing the real world impact of that. There were a number of ships heading from Gaza to Cyprus, carrying aid that was supposed to be heading towards northern Gaza, an area the UN says is on the brink of famine, an area where our crews have seen parents trying to keep their children fed with grass, with barley, meant for feeding animals. Those ships have now turned around with only a portion of the aid delivered. They are heading back to Cyprus, and the impact of that is going to be felt by a lot of very desperate people in Gaza today. Back to you. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that reporting. Back here at home, we're about to see the Maryland governor meeting with small business owners at a recovery center for those affected by the Key Bridge collapse. As we're getting some new pictures, we want to show you right now from the Navy. Really astonishing, showing this wreck underwater. Look at this. These are, we're going to explain this to you, right? These yellow blobs, that's the twisted metal that's lying at the bottom of the Patapsco River. These are 3D images. With the first ships just now passing through a detour channel, one of two channels now open. Here's the thing. That is only for essential ships, like the ones helping with cleanup. We're not talking big cargo ships like the Dolly. That, of course, is the ship that apparently lost power and smashed into one of the pillars of the key bridge, causing that deadly collapse. It's going to take months to clear this river enough for other types of ships to get through. Tom Costello joins us now. 
And Tom, I want to pull up more of these sonar pictures here. Explain what they mean for the cleanup, what kind of insight that's giving crews. Yeah, let's go back to those. These are really telling. These are 3D sonar images from the U.S. Navy salvage operation. And so that yellow that you see, that's the steel. That's the bridge that is sitting on the bottom of the river right there. It, this is as good as it gets. Uh, they cannot take video and photos under the water because it is so cloudy, so dirty, so murky and muddy that literally if they turn on a light, it's like shining a light into a snowstorm or a fog bank. Y you can't see anything. And divers are already only able to see a foot or two ahead of them. Literally, that's it. So this is as good as it's, get, it's going to get for now to map this wreckage on the bottom of the river. And they need to know precisely where everything is because divers have got to go in and they've got to identify where they're going to cut up pieces of the bridge and then pull it out with the crane. But as you and I have discussed, the trouble is that salvage is incredibly dangerous. It is razor sharp. It can cut an oxygen line. It could cut a diver's suit. So they've got to be very careful. And at the moment, the best they can do is somebody talking to them on the intercom saying, looking at a 3D scan, saying, move to your left, move to your right. All right. Above the water, as you see, they're already starting to cut into the bridge that's above water. They're cutting it into chunks and taking it away. This is a very long process. I think what's becoming crystal clear, as evidenced by the Coast Guard comments and the, and the Army Corps of Engineers comments today, this is not going to be a quick and easy process yeah. at all, Hallie. And they've been making that clear, Tom, really for days since this happened. There's also some new court documents that we're getting from the owner and manager of the Dolly. Again, that ship that hit the pillar, that's what caused the collapse. It apparently lost power. That says this, that this casualty was not due to any fault, neglect, or want of care on the part of petitioners, the vessel, or any persons or entities for whose acts petitioners may be responsible. Help us understand this in plain English, Tom. What does this mean? And is it a question here of liability, given what little we know from the NTSB investigation, which is still in its very early moments? Yeah, nobody has yet determined what the cause of the accident was. So th this essentially is the company trying to get out ahead of it and say, mm. wasn't our fault. OK, then how did this happen? I think they're going to be continuing to look at the question of whether contaminated fuel in some way may have disabled that ship. We don't know the answer to that yet. They want to cap their responsibility at $46 million. But as you know, the estimates are this could go to $1.5 billion to replace the bridge. So that really is a, is a shot across the bow early on in the legal fight here. And they're citing a pre-Civil War uh, law, which essentially allows them to limit their liability to the value of the vessel's uh, remains after a casualty. The value of the vessel's remains. That's it. That's what they want to cap their, hmm. their limitations to. So I'm not sure how well this is going to do in federal district court. Clearly, it's going to it's going to push the limits of the law. Tom Costello, we're glad to have you continuing uh, to stay on this important story. Appreciate your reporting. Thank you. To the general election now with you're looking at it live. Former President Donald Trump speaking in Green Bay, Wisconsin, his second stop in the upper Midwest as he's tried to punch through the so-called blue wall in a state Mr. Trump lost last time around by just about 20,000 votes. And Donald Trump's kind of playing catch up here. He's hardly campaigned since he became the presumptive Republican nominee back in early March. Compare that to President Biden, who's been all over the map since Super Tuesday. Look at his stops here. President Biden often going after former President Trump and his fellow Republicans on an issue that Democrats think will be illuminating come November. And that is the issue of abortion access. In just the last couple of hours, in response to a question from our own Gabe Gutierrez, Mr. Trump hinted that he's going to really get into this sometime soon, this abortion debate. Listen. President, do you support the six-week abortion ban that the Florida Supreme Court just upheld? Yeah. We're going to make a statement next week. Vaughn Hilliard is joining us now. He is traveling with the former president covering him in Wisconsin. Okay, so Vaughn, you heard Donald Trump there say he's going to address abortion next week. And I know you've got to use, I think, your golf whisper as you're in the room here. President Biden is already responding to this from his campaign account, basically saying, well, wait a second, Donald Trump, you've already made your statement. Explain the back and forth here. 
Nobody. Right. Nobody. The issue here is that Donald Trump has not been specific uh, about exactly what type of legislation he believes should be put into effect, not only at the federal level, but also at the state level. He has not definitively said that he is opposed to a federal, a national abortion ban. And yet at the state level, he has not articulated exactly what type of legislation in terms of whether it be six weeks or 15 weeks that he would support. And that is where the question around six weeks, which is the current law in the state of Florida is so pertinent because Donald Trump is a Florida resident himself here. And Donald Trump here is suggesting that he will be making a statement. But you mentioned that tweet by Joe Biden, the current president, just a few moments ago, saying that Donald Trump had already made his position very clear. And that is the fact that none of this would be a conversation if it weren't for Donald Trump. And the fact that he nominated three conservatives to the U.S. Supreme Court who helped overturn Roe v. Wade in the summer of 2022. And Donald Trump, not only on that social media post, from last year that you're looking at, but repeatedly on the campaign trail has told crowds that he takes credit for overturning Roe v. Wade and that legislation at the federal or state level would not even be possible without him. And so that is where the clear line is from the Biden, not only the White House, but also the campaign, which issued a new TV ad here just today on the issue. And they intend to make it very clear to the American public at large, which a majority of the country per polling is supportive of women's reproductive rights, Hallie. There's also some news tonight in just the last hour or so that Mr. Trump is apparently suing two co-founders of Truth Social. Why? If I was president, this is complicated. He is suing them, suggesting that they did not properly set up the business in the proper way. They have about 8% stake in the company. Donald Trump has about 60% stake in the company. And when you're looking at the millions of dollars at play here, uh, this is where it could become significant. This is its first week being traded on the stock exchange. And just yesterday alone, Donald Trump watched the value of the company uh, drop by about 20%, which has a value of about $1 billion. And he is uh, prevented from uh, selling his stake in the company for at least six months. And there is a chance that this meme stock could significantly drop. And at a moment here in which he is seeing uh, his financial circumstances, uh, uh, you know, potentially even tied to the sell and the ability to sell true social, the extent to which he can have a greater share of the company under his name is imperative for him. And that's clearly a part of this lawsuit, Allie. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in Green Bay, uh, right in the thick of it as this general election continues on. Vaughn, thank you. From the White House now, in just the last few hours, you had President Biden doing some commander-in-chief business, if you will, with this critical check-in, as the White House calls it, with his count Chinese counterpart, Chinese President Xi Jinping. There's been a lot of tension between these two big superpowers here, right, China and the U.S., like election interference, apparently something that the two leaders talked about, China's involvement in Russia's war in Ukraine, the debate over Taiwan, the possibility of Chinese cyber attacks targeting U.S. infrastructure, and one spot of agreement cracking down on the trafficking of drugs like fentanyl. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist is following this one for us. So what's interesting, we just heard from Vaughn on the campaign trail, right? This is obviously a White House policy issue, but there are political implications as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Obviously, the Biden administration wants to say that it's important that this check-in happen, that the two countries are having these sorts of conversations. We know this phone call was about uh, an hour and 45 minutes long. And this really follows a series of engagements between these two leaders over the last couple of years in particular. Uh, we know that there was this summit in the San Francisco area back in November of last year where the two were able to meet on the sidelines of the APEX summit uh, and have conversations about some of those very issues that you spoke about, uh, talking about the concerns around, uh, around uh, uh, artificial intelligence, talking about concerns around the fentanyl crisis and some of the materials to create that making its way from China to uh, North America and countries in Central America as well. And we saw that we, start, we so started to see the stalling of relations between the two countries, right? Having those conversations, the t military leaders from both countries talking again, trying to avoid any kind of conflict, military conflict that may arise in the uh, South Pacific and in the, in, in the region around, uh, around China. And so the administration says this check-in was really just a part of furthering that conversation. At the same time, we talk about these two countries having uh, some, some areas where they don't agree. We know President Biden brought up uh, China's support for Russia's military infrastructure and building, uh, uh, it's contributing to its ability to build and fight the war in Ukraine. And so 
Uh, Hallie, these are things that we're going to continue to see. We know Secretary Yellen, Treasury Secretary, will go to China tomorrow, and Secretary Blinken will travel there in the coming weeks, Hallie. Aaron at Gilchrist, thank you very much for that. Coming up here on the show, we've got breaking news on the boom in women's basketball. We just got the ratings for that monster matchup last night. I'm telling you, they will blow your mind. We're going to talk about it in just a second. Plus, why so many big names in entertainment are joining forces to take on big tech. It's coming up. So in just the last 20 minutes, we are really for real learning that in big, bold letters, the women's basketball boom is real. Guess how many people watched that huge Iowa LSU game featuring Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese? Guess. It was the most watched college basketball game on ESPN ever. Men or women. Nobody has ever watched this many college players play basketball on ESPN. Considering this game, 12.3 million viewers. That is bonkers bananas huge okay that's an all-time record for a women's college basketball game on any channel two million more people that watched when these two played last year remember that was the final that was the final this was just the elite eight to put it in perspective the two elite eight games on sunday in the men's tournament averaged 12.8 million viewers so we're talking basically nearly even numbers between the men and the women what is what is behind that well you know it it's these two these two superstars Caitlin Clark for Iowa, Angel Reese for LSU. And yes, it was Caitlin Clark winning this time, dropping 41 points to get Iowa to the Final Four. But Angel Reese, she is a star in her own right, big time. Kurt Badenhausen joins us now, the sports business reporter for Sportico. Can I pull back the curtain? We talked in our morning meeting about, like, hey, the ratings are probably going to come out right around showtime for the women's, you know, the women's game last night. Like, it could be huge. It could be 8 million. It could be 10 million. And then this blew that out of the water, right? I did a podcast this morning that talked about, oh, I don't think it's going to hit the 9.9 .9 million oh, because it's you ESPN instead of ABC. It's the quarterfinals instead of the finals. Uh, uh, my Twitter feed was just a continuous, holy, <laughs> you know what? Uh, the number's crazy uh, and really speaks to, again, Caitlin Clark is driving the train here, Angel Reese, incredible. But it really speaks to the momentum of the whole sport. Uh, the, the the other, the UConn game did great numbers too. Uh, the top five uh, most followed uh, college basketball players on Instagram, they're all women. Yeah, so so Amazing. the women are the stars in college basketball right now, uh, and 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 we're seeing that across uh, whether it's women's soccer, we're, we're this incredible momentum and the cycles just feeding each other, where these athletes are becoming stars, advertisers are recognizing yeah. it, they're spending money, salaries are going up, franchise values are going up. To put this in perspective, just to give people a sense of like why twelve point three million is so bonkers, that's more than any baseball game last year. Only one NBA game beat it. It beat almost every college football game, except for like the playoffs, Ohio State, Michigan, the SEC title game, just the heavy hitters. So this number is gangbusters. Pull on that thread about what this means for women's sports, right? The idea that more people are tuning in, the idea that it is a sort of in some ways a self-fulfilling cycle of sort of women cheering on women, people watching women, women getting more higher profile, et cetera. We've seen it all, all season long. The, the women's game has had all the buzz uh, when we're talking about college basketball this year. Uh, and, and again, we're, we're seeing it with women's soccer. We're seeing momentum with the WNBA. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we look at the business of sports at Sportico, and we're looking at these incredible franchise valuations where NWSL, you had clubs selling for $2 million three years ago. Now, now they're going for over $100 million. Yeah. Angel City's looking to raise money at $200 million. Uh, and so, and the people who are buying into this, they're not doing this just be, just out of the goodness of their heart. This isn't, oh, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's spend some money right. on women. This is, these are serious investors who are looking, betting on women as a good long-term investment. And they're looking to get a good ROI from their investment. Well, listen, Kurt, more all that story, always bet on women. Kurt Biden has oh, oh, 100%. Thank you, thank you. I tell my wife that always. Very smart. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Really interesting developing news tonight. Appreciate it. Also tonight, a pretty big moment for Disney. A very big 24 hours coming up with an investor moving to try to shake up the company's leadership, including CEO Bob Iger. We're talking about this guy, Nelson Peltz. He's gone after Disney and Iger for a whole bunch of stuff, but his main issue is succession because Peltz says the board's most important job has been to find somebody other than Iger to run Disney. 
Peltz wants to get his people on the board to work on a succession plan. And the Wall Street Journal tonight reports Disney and Iger are leading the board of directors vote so far, meaning that it looks like things should stay status quo. We will see probably tomorrow if Nelson Peltz can get the shakeup he wants. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the mayor of Uvalde, Texas, resigning immediately because of unexpected health issues. Cody Smith was not mayor at the time of that deadly Robb Elementary School shooting in which 21 people were killed. He was in charge when the city commissioned a report that ended up defending what police officers did and importantly did not do that day in May 2022. This comes as the city's police chief is also supposed to leave his position this week. Number two, an American teenager is among those killed by an avalanche near a Swiss resort. We first told you about this yesterday. The name of the 15-year-old has not been released. A man and a woman were also killed. We don't know if they were all related. Number three, Tesla shares down today after the company missed expectations for its first quarter. Car deliveries dropping 8% from the same time last year. That's Tesla's first annual dip since 2020. The company says it was partially because of the conflict in the Red Sea. Number four, John Stewart claiming Apple discouraged him from interviewing the FTC chair while he was working on his old Apple TV show. Stewart says Apple basically told him, do not talk to her. Her being Lena Khan, the FTC head, and Stewart broke the story to Khan herself on The Daily Show overnight. Khan had written a report calling for the breakup of big tech companies like Apple. Apple reps have not responded to our request for comment. Number five, more than 200 people, including Stevie Wonder, Billie Eilish, Nicki Minaj, signing an open letter to AI developers, saying AI is a threat to actual human artists by potentially replacing musicians, diluting their royalties. The letter says when used responsibly, responsibly rather, AI does have enormous potential to advance creativity. Coming up, more to get to, including the race off the coast of Nigeria, trying to get tourists back on their cruise ship for days. We'll tell you how this dream vacation turned into a nightmare for some. But first, why Adidas is walking back a soccer jersey design. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Turkey, at least 29 people are dead after a fire in Istanbul. It started in a popular club, which has been closed for renovations. The flames then spread to several floors of this building, which is 16 stories tall. All the victims are believed to have been involved in the renovation. Officials are still trying to figure out what started this fire in the first place. In Venezuela, more fires there. A record number of wildfires, in fact. And climate change, a big factor. Researchers have spotted more than 30,000 so-called fire points during the first three months of the year. That's the most since they started keeping records back in 1999. Sometimes fires, of course, are started on purpose to clear land for farming, but lately they've been spreading a lot because of drought and really hot temperatures. This includes part of the Amazon, too. And out of Germany, Adidas says fans of the national team cannot customize Customize their jerseys with the number 44. Why? Because some people pointed out that the font, if you look at it, makes it look like a symbol of the Nazi SS units responsible for some of the worst atrocities of a Holocaust. The designer says they checked what the numbers would look like. Nobody flagged the similarity, but a redesign for the number four is in the works. Tonight, a dream vacation turning into a nightmare for passengers after their cruise ship left them stranded on an island. So that led to some like amazing race style moves to try to catch it at the next port started last week when the guests, six Americans, two Australians, were late getting back from a private tour. Norwegian, the cruise ship company, says that, hey, while this is an unfortunate situation, guests are responsible for making sure they get back to the boat at the time they're supposed to. Josh Letterman is joining us now with more. I mean, it really does sound like something out of The Amazing Race. Where are they, these people? Why, like, where are they trying to catch this boat? Why aren't they going home at this point? What's up? So if you've been on a cruise before, Hal, you know that essentially when you get to port, you have two options. You can go on an organized tour that is run by the cruise company, where they kind of take responsibility for getting you back on time, or you can do your own thing. These eight passengers did their own thing. They booked a private tour. There was some issue. They didn't get brought back to the ship on time. And when they got back to the ship, it was still there, but it was already in the process of leaving. Kind of like if you show up for a flight after the doors have 
have closed, but the plane is still technically on the ground. And so the cruise company says, look, it is well known to all the passengers what time we're leaving. We announce it on the intercom. We put it on a poster next to the exit of the cruise ship as you're getting off the ship. You got to get back to the ship on time or the ship is going to leave without you. But these passengers say they really feel like Norwegian dropped the ball here. And I want you to hear from a, one of them, Jill Campbell, who told the Today Show about her experience. Take a look. I believe that they really forgot that they are people working in the hospitality industry and um, that really the safety is and the well-being of their customers should be their first priority. And and that should be placed first. Um, we, we believe there was a basic duty of care that they had forgotten about. Earlier today, the ship arrived in Senegal, and just as we were coming on the air, Hallie, Norwegian followed up with us to say that all eight of those passengers have now reboarded the ship successfully. There's also this other piece of it, right? Another woman who was left on the island, but for different reason. This was a, this was a medical situation. That's right. She's 80 years old, yeah. Julie Lenkoff. She apparently uh, started coming down with uh, some memory and vision problems. The ship's medical personnel evaluated her and said, look, you need to go to a hospital. Mm. So she went to the clinic on the island. Uh, and at that point, her family says the ship left her there to die. And she eventually had to make her way back to the U.S. where they believe she uh, now believe she had had a stroke. Uh, but the cruise line says, look, once she got off and went to that clinic, we tried to follow up with her. We called her multiple times. She was released from that clinic uh, in good condition. And given privacy laws, we couldn't call anyone else and disclose her medical condition. They say they did everything possible to try to get more updates about her and to help her once she was in port. But ultimately, it is true that ship left without that, that patient who had, yeah. who had been entered that clinic. Josh Letterman watching all of it unfold. Josh, thank you. Coming up, fighting for the right to see the total solar eclipse. The legal battle just launched by inmates in one state's prison. We'll tell you why. Plus, the push to remove a council member from office in one state, how his ties to white nationalism are leaving a community divided. All right, so polls are about to close pretty soon. In this local election that's making headlines nationally, and if you're like, well, wait a second, Hallie, why do I care about an Oklahoma City Council meeting? Let me tell you why. This goes back to 2017, when a guy named Judd Blevins, you're about to see him here on screen, marched alongside white supremacists in that big Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Remember that? He says he was just there to help preserve statues of American soldiers because, in his words, it's our heritage. Well, last year, this guy gets elected as a city council member in this Oklahoma town, something that the more progressive voters in one of the country's most quickly diversifying towns, they were not happy about that. That sparked this push to get him out of office. There's this recall election today for that. And the person who's been on this story from the jump is our Brandy Zadrozny, who is joining us now from Enid, Oklahoma. So Brandy, what's so interesting here, right? The demographics of this city that have changed a lot in the last few years. It's still conservative, but it's a recall election that's gotten a lot of attention in some of the sort of corners of the internet and you know space that you cover. Yeah, this has been a real talker across the internet and and more mainstream news spaces, and it's it's a it's a wild story, and it's mostly a wild story because um, we often see you know far right extremism slinking into local government is a story that we've seen quite a lot actually, especially after um, January 6th and even before that during the rise of the alt-right. What we don't see as much is this coalition of, yes, progressive Democrats that came and joined this group called the Enid Social Justice Committee, but also people like the mayor, who is a conservative Republican, people like Cheryl Patterson, who's running against Jed Blevins, Jed Blevins um, conservative Republican. It really is this coalition of people who might have a lot of differences generally, but can say this isn't happening here. Now, we've been talking to people outside of this polling place all day, and they've had uh, a lot of interesting things to say. Take a listen. It's an embarrassment to the community to have anybody who had Nazi affiliations on the city council. Just because the fact that he has uh, white nationalists and or Nazi ties and just the fact that that's, that's not, well, obviously I'm morally opposed to that, plus that's just not a good image for Enid. People do care that it does matter what you've done, who you've associated with, and who you're still associating with if you're saying you don't have to answer questions. 
So we're getting all this kind of response here. People saying they didn't know and people saying that they wanted a redo and that's just what they're getting today. Can you explain that piece of it, right? Because um, was this known before his election last year? That's complicated. Was this on the internet? Yes. But again, Enid is a pretty conservative place. Um, people who did notice it are people who are the more progressive people. Now, this doesn't mean that they're young and on the internet all the time. My two favorite sources from this story, um, Connie and Nancy, are in their 70s, um, progressive Democratic mm -hmm. ladies, and they found this stuff on the internet and they uh, they told other voters about it. And these are the groups that, um, that went around and got signatures and that had this recall petition filed. So it's really because of them that we're here at all today. Uh, we love seeing you know you out in the field doing this reporting, Brandy, because you do so much of it in this space. What is the, when will we know if this guy's been recalled or not? Like tonight, do we think? Tomorrow morning? Yeah, we will see how much power this coalition actually has tonight around 8.30 Oklahoma okay. time. We'll be watching uh, Brady Sadrosny. Good to see you there. And Enid, thank you so much for bringing us that story. To New York now, where we're learning tonight that some inmates in state prisons there are suing the corrections department. Why? For their decision to put prisons on lockdown during next week's solar eclipse. Now, typically, these are prisoners who are allowed outside between 2 and 5 p.m. If you have a pulse, you probably know that that is when this eclipse is set to happen just six days from now. That day, however, these inmates will be forced to stay in wherever their housing units are. Now, this lawsuit from inmates says, I'm quoting here, that a solar eclipse, you see it here, is a rare natural phenomenon with great religious significance to many. And that if they can't see it, if they can't watch it happen, then they're going to be denied, in their words, constitutional rights to practice their religion. Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now to break it all down. There's a million eclipse stories out there. This one is really interesting here. What is the what is the rationale from the prisons? Is this security, why they're forcing prisoners to be inside during the eclipse? Well, we got our hands on the memo that went out to the prisons, and they called this a, quote, proactive approach to ensure the safety and integrity of the facilities, pointing to the darkness associated okay. with the eclipse. But they didn't give any more detail beyond that. I was on the phone with the spokesperson. He refused to go into detail, pointing to the statement. Let's pull it up, saying the department does not comment on pending litigation. Religious requests related to viewing the eclipse are currently under review, hinting perhaps there that they might have some sort of settlement uh, to resolve this situation, noting that, yes, prisoners between 2 and 5 p.m. will be asked to stay indoors. Mm. At the same time, they are providing glasses to anyone who might happen to be able to view the eclipse out the window. Who might be out, to, okay, who might be yeah. near a window, but yeah, able to see it. Exactly. You, you talked about the potential religious exemption here. What, um, help us understand that religious argument when it relates to a, a total eclipse, which is super rare. Yeah, well, as part of this lawsuit, there were testimonies, uh, written uh, memos made by the prisoners. There's six plaintiffs in total in this lawsuit. Let's just go through some of them. The Christian plaintiff writing that portions of the Bible that allude to what many have attributed to a solar eclipse during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Muslim plaintiff in this lawsuit writing one of the holiest books of Islam, the Hadith, which describes what many believe to be an eclipse happening as Muhammad's son died. And then the atheist plaintiff writing, observing the solar eclipse with people of different faiths is crucial to practicing his own faith. So this is very much seen as a religious experience for these plaintiffs. I was just on the phone with the attorney representing them to, to asking him if there's going to be any sort of resolution to this. They're running out of time. It's Monday. Well, like, well, they gotta, they, you know. That is exactly his point. He said that there is a phone call scheduled tomorrow with all parties involved. Hopefully they can reach a settlement. We'll have to wait and see. And he reiterated that all they're asking for is that the plaintiffs as well as anyone else who's put in for a religious exemption to this memo, be able to go out and see the eclipse in person. You can see the path of totality there with the question, should these New York prisoners be allowed to watch the eclipse? Maybe find out this week. Or we'll tomorrow. See. Or tomorrow. Or soon. Thank you so much, Erin. It's great to see you. Appreciate it. Got a lot more ahead, including the cost crunch of childcare. If you're a parent, I know you know this. I know you feel it. How daycares are trying to find a balance between being a business and being an essential provider. Next.
to tonight's Original Now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's daycare centers facing a really big challenge here. They lost billions of dollars in money from the pandemic era, which has forced some places to close down. Others have had to raise what they charge. They've had to basically raise tuition. Caught in the middle, of course, a lot of families who are already struggling to make ends meet. Here's Raheem Ellis. Daycare is a place where kids can dream to be anything. A doctor, a post office worker, a dragon. But centers like this, Victoria's Castle Daycare in New York, are in a tough spot. $24 billion in pandemic federal funding for child care, used for things like tuition assistance and teacher pay, ran out back in September. Now that the crisis is over, it just seemed like everybody forgot that we were here. Director Erica Perez says the center lost a quarter of its funding and had to raise tuition by about $200 a month. It's the center's first tuition hike in years. It puts a strain on some families. Carell Bain is a single mother and a post office worker, and for her, money is tight. Next month, her four-year-old will move from three days a week in daycare to five days, bumping her monthly tuition to more than twelve hundred dollars a thousand plus is almost damn near my whole check and hopefully it can be brought down a little sum the daycare tries to work with lower income families budgets but that can be tough because the center also needs to make money that is always the concern you know how how flexible can i be in for how long before the whole you know deck of cards comes crumbling down Sometimes she's forced to make an agonizing decision. Either keep a family that can't pay or let the child go. You're almost, you know, saying goodbye to one of your family members. You become very attached to your families in, in your care. The loss of funding also means teachers here are getting hundreds less in bonuses. I wouldn't leave because we're going through a tough time. That's when you stick it out the yeah, most. Yeah, it's more than just money here. Over a few months, the center's enrollment more than doubled after other daycares in the area shut down. It's a familiar story nationwide. The Century Foundation, a think tank, estimates in each state, tens, even hundreds of thousands of kids could lose care. And a new survey of early childhood providers found more than half knew of a program closing in their community in the past few months. When we don't have reliable child care options, that means that, you know, many women are going to either lower their work hours or leave the workforce altogether. President Biden just signing a spending bill that'll give an extra billion dollars to child care programs. And some say the private sector has a role too. Media company The Skim launched a campaign calling on businesses to publicly share their child care policies. The responsibility to help working families, working parents and women stay in the workforce, stay as participants in this economy, doesn't just fall on one person or one part of the society. All of these businesses like Verizon, Paramount and MasterCard did share their plans, including things like work flexibility and care subsidies or stipends. It's a big problem begging a bigger solution to help ease the burden on parents looking to give their kids a brighter future. Rahema is joining us now. It is such a crunch for so many families. What are some of the other options for people who've got to have this child care but, but just don't have the resources to be able to pay for it? In some instances, Hallie, it's slim or none. Some yeah. families find that they have to try and ask for friends help to, or family to help. If they're in a community where they don't have a lot of friends or family, maybe it means they have to relocate. It was mentioned in the piece, sometimes families have to cut yep. back on their hours. And what does that mean? That means they're going to be looking to the state, the city, and the government for some kind of welfare. So it's a whole community impact that's going on here. And it means not just the centers are struggling, but these families are struggling, too, for where will they provide care for their children while they go to work? Rahima Ellis, uh, so many families, you know, thinking about this, dealing with this. We're glad to have you reporting on it for us tonight. It's good to see you. Thank you. That does it for us for this hour. And a reminder, starting on Sunday night, that'll be my first night as anchor of the Sunday Nightly News on your local NBC station starting at 630. I'm excited to see you then. But for now, here on NBC News Now, more coverage picks up right now. 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.